Hi, everyone. Thanks for all coming today. Um, can everyone hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, so since this is the last lecture of this side and ASDA collaboration lecture series, both me and the other gen are very excited and honored to be the last lectures. And we will be sharing our research and personal experiences on imposter syndrome today. And just a quick disclaimer is that none of us are professionals on this topic, um, but we're just sharing the things that we've learned through reading different research articles and just sharing our own experiences in dealing with imposter syndrome. And both of us wanna give a quick shout out to Side and ASDA for both giving us an opportunity to speak on this topic and on this platform. So before we begin, we kinda of wanna give a bit of a background on ourselves. So my name is Jennifer Chang. I'm from the Bay Area and I'm in the class of 2023 at UCLA Dentistry. Um, I graduated in Berkeley in 2018 and uh, go Bears. And in between, I took a gap year and where I was working as a dental assistant at a federally qualified health center. So for those who don't know what a federally qualified health center is, um, there are sites that are funded by the government and they were kind of created to serve as one of the primary safety net providers for the low income uninsured and homeless populations. So while I was working there, I became more aware of the difficulties that minorities and low income populations face when trying to receive any dental treatment or any sort of healthcare in general. And that's kind of why uh, I, re that was one of the main reasons I wanted to join SIDE. I think it's important as future healthcare providers to be more aware and serve as an advocate for these marginalized populations. Hi, so my name is Jennifer Nguyen. I'm also part of the class of 2023 at UCLA School of Dentistry. I originally graduated from UC Irvine in the class of 2018. So like the other Jennifer, I took a gap year. Uh, I'm originally from the Pasadena area. So I've actually never really left Southern California for school or anything, I guess, really. <laughs> it's a big triangle. Like I came from Pasadena and then I moved down to Irvine and now I'm in Westwood. So I've never really left Southern California. Um, besides being a part of SIDE, I am the ASDA fund, one of the ASDA fundraising committee chairs. And the, one of the main reasons why I joined SIDE is because I was originally part of a student-run free health clinic in undergrad. So we were able to see a lot of underserved populations that, that may or may not necessarily have health insurance. And wanting to learn more about my community and the different populations that need care is one of my main goals as a healthcare provider. So joining SIDE was a great opportunity for me to reach out and find more about, you know, LA and about the people that I can serve. So before we move on, and I would like to go through our outline for today. So the very first thing that we will be talking about is what is imposter syndrome? So we'll be going through some of the definitions and one of the very first studies that was published about imposter syndrome. We'll go through imposter syndrome facts and myths. We'll also go through, we also wanna go through and emphasize that you're not alone and that imposter syndrome is very real, especially as a pre-health uh, pre -health student, but also just as any healthcare professional. And We'll also segue again into imposter syndrome in healthcare, and we'll talk a little bit more about how it can impact us. So throughout the presentation, we'll be asking a series of questions that we would like for you to all participate in if you can. And then uh, it'll be anonymous, but we'll be sharing like the aggregate results at, of the poll after each question. So let's begin with the first question. So the first question is, have you heard of the term imposter syndrome? So I'll be launching the poll right now. Okay, and I'll share the results. So 
I think a ma good majority of you have heard of the term imposter syndrome. Some of you haven't, so I'm glad that you guys are with us today. And the next question is, do you think self-doubt and imposter syndrome are the same thing? So I want you to pull them out. I'm going to share the results. And most of you guys don't think that they're the same thing. So we'll be going through a lot. We'll be discussing both of these questions in the next few slides. And thanks for participating as well. <laughs> so for those who haven't really heard of the term imposter syndrome, uh, I, want, I want for you to ask yourself these questions. Have you ever had these thoughts? Can I manage and assign tasks to people underneath me? Do I deserve to be here? Or maybe if that doesn't, if you haven't thought of those questions before, maybe, you know, if you get a leadership position and then someone congratulates you and you just say, ah, no, 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 I, you know, I got lucky, but thanks. Or I think this is happening to a lot of the D2s who are here with us today, but you know, we're in lab and then we're struggling with dentures and then someone comes up to us and goes like, do you need any help? And you're still struggling on your own, but you said, you know, I'm good. I got this. And if that doesn't click a bell, maybe this will do. Sometimes you think to yourself, I have no clue what I'm doing, but you know, you still continue and you successfully complete the task. So if you had some of these thoughts or feelings before, you might have potentially had imposter syndrome. And so we'll go through kind of the definition of imposter syndrome right now. So the first people who coined the term imposter syndrome and defined it uh, was Clance and Imes. And they defined it as the psychological experience of believing that one's accomplishments came about not through genuine ability, but as a result of having been lucky, having worked harder than others, or having manipulated others' impressions. So currently, imposter syndrome is not recognized as a psych psychiatric disorder in the DSM or ICD. So they're just like a manual for psychologists and psychiatrists to diagnose certain disorders. But imposter syndrome is correlated to other psychological dis disorders such as anxiety and depression. And we'll talk a little bit more about it later on. So I wanna st start from the very beginning of the first research that Clance and Imes did. So, you know, Clance and Imes, they were graduates, uh, they were professors, so they went through graduate school, then became a professor, and then they had thoughts of like feeling like an imposter, and they were, you know, they didn't feel like they deserved to be there, and then they started kind of interviewing other people who were in the same, like in the same, in their same shoes. So they started interviewing and working with 150 highly successful working females, and these female participants were you know, people, researchers with a doctorate degree, they're respected professionals in their various fields. Uh, and above all, they were, they achieved academic excellence than the norm. And as Clance and Imes were interviewing them, they noticed that they had a lot of similar experiences among all these participants. Uh, a lot of them felt like they didn't deserve the success or recognition that they received. Um, they didn't think they were smart or successful, but rather they considered their success because they were lucky. Maybe they, other someone made a mistake and they were there at the right time at the right place, or they just worked extremely hard. So they attributed a lot of their success to like being lucky or like external factors. And there are definitely a lot of successful people who experience imposter syndrome. So here's a quote for you. So does anyone know who this quote is from? I'll read it out loud. Um, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody, and they're going to find me out. So if you know it, you can type in the chat. I'll wait like 10 seconds right here. Oh, someone actually got it. Um, so this quote is by Maya Angelou. And I think a lot of us have read her short stories or her po 
poems in high school. So, you know, she's a very well-renowned and talented writer who achieved su such success in her field, but has also feelings of being an imposter and feeling exposed. So just know that there are a lot of highly successful people who experience this as well. So here are some symptoms of imposter syndrome, maybe some self-doubt, frustration, general anxiety, lack of self-confidence, and depression. So following back to the original research that uh, Plants and Imes conducted, they both of them kind of want to hypothesize what could be the trigger or onset of someone getting imposter syndrome. So Plants hypothesized that it could be some, it could be because of someone's early childhood environment. So I will describe kind of their hypothesis in two ways. The first one I would kind of describe it as the problem child who wants validation. So, you know, like, I don't know if anyone has experienced this, but you know, sometimes you have that really well-respected family figure in your house, like your household, and your family and outsiders will compare you to them, right? So like oftentimes they'll be like, oh, you'll never be as successful as so-and-so, or, you know, look at them, they're, they're doing X, Y, and Z, you know, they have the college education, they have the job, you know, stuff like that, right? So you work, you uh, work really, really hard to like try to achieve the same success as this model figure. And one day you achieve it, but now you start to have doubts about yourself because you have two different beliefs. One is what your family says was correct, right? Like you're, you believe that, you know, you'll be never, you'll never be as successful, but then you are also a very successful person, like from what the outside is seeing, right? So you'll start to have develop like doubts about whether or not you actually, like your success is because of your internal, like you yourself as a person or your abilities, right? So that's, their hy first hypothesis. And then the second one they described is kind of like the perfect model student who hits a road bump. So, you know, like, you know, in elementary school, you have straight A's, you know, high school straight A's, and then suddenly, you know, you start to hit like, things aren't as smooth as it used to be, right? And then maybe like later on in life, you do achieve success, but because of these small road bumps, you will, you will, you'll doubt whether you actually have the ability to succeed. So these are two um, hypotheses where they kind of group them in two different categories, what uh, Plants and Imes hypothesized. So I thought this was interesting because, you know, hearing these two hypotheses, I can personally see how these can ca cause imposter syndrome. So more and more research is coming out in regards to imposter syndrome and researchers needed a way to quantify a lot of the data. So they came up with questionnaires and different ways of, to measure this. Um, so the first one that came out was by Harvey. So it was like a 14 questionnaire targeted mainly towards graduate, undergraduate students. And then clans themselves also developed their own survey. Um, this one kind of accounted for a lot of the clinically observed attributes that or feelings they saw during their interviews, one-on-one -on -one with participants. So the questions like being, the fear of being evaluated or feeling less capable were incorporated into the survey. And then the two other that I uh, wrote on the PowerPoint, those are other, ser other ways and measurements um, that are used today. Um, there are more questions in them and they kind of just like, the more questions help them redefine what imposter syndrome is. And now we'll hand it over. And then last thing, um, so going back to the poll question, do you think self-doubt and imposter syndrome are the same thing? Um, so a lot of the research that I've read, they kind of go hand in hand with one another. I wouldn't say like, no, they aren't. They, they're very closely tied to one another. A lot of times imposter syndrome fall, falls underneath self-doubt as a subcategory. And then sometimes other papers will say like, if you have imposter syndrome, you'll definitely have self-doubt. And I think the main thing, the main difference or the fine line in between the two is imposter syndrome is an intense feeling of self-doubt. And it's like during that period of time, like, you know, the constant description of feeling exposed by someone else. And another term that I do want to bring up is gaslighting. So usually gaslighting is described to 
like unhealthy romantic relationships. But I think it really applies to imposter syndrome as well, because gaslighting is kind of, I would describe it as like manipulating someone into questioning their beliefs, their judgment, their sanity. So if you self gaslight yourself, that's kind of like what imposter syndrome is, right? Like you put down yourself, your own accomplishments, your own desires. And I think that's why uh, these two terms are things that I want to bring up in this lecture today. So we're going to move on to a, another poll question. Um, it's a true or false question. I would just like everyone to answer it to the best of their ability. Is, it tr is this statement true or false? Imposter syndrome only happens among working professionals. So thank you to everyone that voted. Um, as you can see, most people chose false and the statement is false. So imposter syndrome doesn't only work, doesn't only happen among working professionals. So I would like to share this other quote. I still sometimes feel like a loser kid in high school and I just have to pick myself up and tell myself that I'm a superstar every morning so that I can get through this day and be for my fans what they need for me to be. Right, and this is actually a quote from Lady Gaga. I think it's really important to note that she is very extroverted and she's just every possible, almost outrageous thing that you can be, but like she herself also feels imposter syndrome and she at times feels as if she's not enough. And I think if you would try to ask anyone like who is the most confident person that you could think of at the top of your head, I believe a lot of people would say Lady Gaga. So again, I just want to go back to the true false questions for a little bit. It's like, even though like the statement is false, it's important to, important to emphasize like almost anyone that you could possibly think of who has success could possibly have imposter syndrome. So going to a study um, about, or just going into an overall, an overall look through through the types of populations that people have done imposter syndrome studies on. So the first one that I had noticed was the, there was Scheer and Buffard who did an imposter syndrome study on fifth and sixth graders. 80% um, of the fifth and sixth graders that they surveyed had feelings of some sort of feelings of imposter syndrome, maybe it's like self-doubt or anxiety. And it's kind of jarring because if you think about fifth and sixth graders, they're so young, maybe they're like 10, 11, 12 years old, and they already have these feelings when they're in school. Um, adolescents in general, by Caseman, they've been, got, they've looked at imp whether or not this population has imposter syndrome, college students and graduate students. Um, this study by Jostel in 2012, 82% of the graduate students that they surveyed actually had imposter syndrome, which I think really highlights like how even we as successful graduate students, like um, possible pre-health professional students have a high chance of imposter syndrome. Professionals have been surveyed, people like nurses, doctors, physician assistants, they have all been surveyed and some of these people do have imposter syndrome. So our next poll question is another true false question. Um, imposter syndrome happens only in females. Okay, so um, everyone can see the results and everyone voted false. Thank you to everyone that voted. And the answer is false, right? Um, imposter syndrome doesn't always happen in females. Um, some of the first studies were done specifically in females. So people had originally thought that, oh, imposter syndrome only happens to females. Um, another interesting quote that 
we had found and Dr. Bibb had also pointed out to us is no matter what we've done, there comes a point where you think, how did I get here? When are they going to discover that I am in fact a fraud and take everything away from me? Right. And this whole quote kind of symbolizes all of the symptoms and the thoughts and feelings that Jennifer had initially mentioned at the very beginning that has to do with imposter syndrome. And this quote is actually by Tom Hanks. Like there he is getting the Presidential Medal of Honor from, you know, President Obama, which again indicates like very successful people can have imposter syndrome. And, you know, it's very important to acknowledge that we are all capable of having it. Um, so in this study by Coakley, uh, in 2015, they actually measured the differences between imposter syndrome and men and women. Um, so again, to reiterate, both men and women experience imposter syndrome. However, they they tend to internalize it in different ways. So women are more likely to equate academic success with GPA. So which means that, let's say, for example, a female might feel as if they're not good enough because maybe their GPA is high, but they don't really internalize that success. So they have this indication, this kind of correlation with academic success, GPA, and like that juxtaposition causes imposter syndrome. However, men are more likely to experience academic disengagement. So from my understanding of this paper, it's kind of like if a male is tasked with some an assignment and they feel as if they're not able to completely fulfill it to the 100% 100 success they may feel as if they're going to separate like however that task goes with their from their own self-worth so let's say for example it doesn't go as well as it should have planned they would disengage emotionally and that's how they would internalize imposter syndrome so moving on to another true false question, minority students are likely to have imposter syndrome compared to their peers. If, please answer true or false to whatever you think is true or false. Okay, so about 59% people voted true. Thank you for everyone that uh, participated also. Um, so the answer to this one is actually false. Minority students are actually more likely to have imposter syndrome compared to their non-minority peers. So in this uh, lit, lit review by Chen in 2019, imposter syndrome is actually very, it's, it's in a lot of minority populations, inclu including, but not limited to, African American students, Asian American students, and Latinx college students. Factors that predispose um, for these, pre that predispose these populations to have imposter syndrome include lack of ac adequate financial aid, and because of this, they might work to support themselves. Um, they may also face racial discrimination while they're in school. And in doing so, they would endure negative stereotypes. Um, some of these individuals might be first generation college students. So they have external stressors, such as like being trying to enroll in school, getting financial aid, and just navigating the university system as a whole. So it might, they are more predisposed to have imposter syndrome. Um, continuing from this lit review, um, they had indicated that racial and ethnic minority students are actually at a higher risk for psychological distress overall. So they are also more likely to have undiagnosed, undiagnosed psychological, uh, psychological distressors. Um, some of the barriers that would prevent them from accessing care include implicit bias, stigma, so you know, stigma in minority, minority communities in finding like psychiatric or psychological help, um, differences in illness beliefs. Um, some minority communities may not even believe psychological, like psychological issues are a real illness. Lack of, lack of cross-culturally trained clinicians. So this means that maybe an a minority individual tried to find 
um, help. And the psychiatrist or psychologist that they try to talk to may not know the nuances of their culture or like the barriers that they need to, to actually access these psycho to access psychiatric help. So all of these can actually prevent minority students from kind of understanding their own mental health and not necessarily finding the help, the clinical help that they need. So in conclusion, <laughs> imposter syndrome can actually be further aggravated by all the previous factors that we had mentioned, such as first generation university students and you know, lack of financial aid. So our next poll question is, uh, do you believe the intensity of imposter syndrome would decrease with experience? Okay, well, we're split 50-50. <laughs> I actually didn't expect that. Um, thank you for everyone that voted, by the way. Um, so there was actually, it's actually true to an extent. So um, this study by Bravada actually is a, is a literature review, review that looked at a variety of ages that had a variety of papers that Kind of looked at age as an indication for imposter syndrome. So there's actually differing research results. Research results, um, some papers had said they're negatively correlated. So as we all, as half of us believe, um, older and more experienced adults have less imposter syndrome and others had said there's no correlation. So even as we do get older, we still will experience imposter syndrome. So kind of moving on from this, I wanted to focus more on us, right, as pre, possibly pre-health students, pre-dental students, um, and pre, or pre-doctoral students, I guess. <laughs> um, in a study by Holiday in 2019, they actually looked at imposter syndrome in medical and dental students at Harvard, and they had indicated that the female gender is a strong predictor of imposter syndrome, and other factors can include gap years and age. So in terms of gap years, it can kind of go both ways, right? Um, they had hypothesized that, you know, maybe the more gap years you have, you, the more um, real world experience that you may have in your desired profession, right? And so you feel less imposter syndrome. But at the same time, like, if you take more gap years, you've been out of school for longer, you may not study, you may have like a larger learning curve and learning how to study compared to your peers that have gone straight into school. Um, again, with age, you know, it could go either way. <laughs> um, um, you know, as you get older you, and you go back to school, there's also a possibility of having more responsibilities and maybe not having that same school or educational experience as your younger peers might have. Um, the paper also mentioned that the need for more female role models for certain students might be able to decrease imposter syndrome. So a more, a more in another study <laughs> it actually is by LaDonna. It focuses on imposter syndrome and white coats. So this study actually says that imposter syndrome can occur at any stage of a physician's career. So this study actually looked at residents and students and being able to, this, this study actually struck a nerve with me because I actually haven't seen a patient yet as an incoming D2 student. But I think the hardest thing that I can see potentially about seeing a patient is that I don't know if I would be able to convince my patient to accept my treatment plan. And this study kind of brings, goes along the same tones as in, you know, in order for a patient to accept your treatment plan, to accept your diagnosis, you have to be confident, right? You have to play the role of a competent healthcare provider, right? And in doing so, like maybe you're wearing scrubs, you might be wearing a white coat, right? Um, but if you don't feel that confident on the inside, right, that can lead to imposter syndrome. So by 
almost like putting on this white coat and becoming someone else, you can perpetuate imposter syndrome within yourself. So it's important to kind of maybe realize those feelings like I did. <laughs> but um, the paper also indicates that in order to kind of prevent this from happening, there could be some curriculum changes in you know, healthcare professional schooling. Um, I think one of the important things that they mentioned is to discuss imposter syndrome while in school and kind of see where everyone is at because without having these discussions, no one knows what you're thinking, right? And it's and so by having these discussions, we are able to see like how how comfortable people are and that understanding that we're not alone. So these are the two last questions for the poll and just to we thank you again for participating. Um, so the first question is now that we you heard more research about it, now we have defined some of these symptoms. Um, have you experienced imposter syndrome? So just uh, the, the same question as the first question is before I'll launch the poll. Wait, two more seconds. Okay. So I feel like we kind of convinced some people to, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, hopefully through this lecture, you might have identified with some of these symptoms and, you know, we want to kind of bring up now, like, how can we like resolve or like, you know, lessen the experience of imposter syndrome. But last question, um, do you know of someone who experience imposter syndrome. Last one, launch poll. Okay. And here are the results. So I think quite a few people know of others who experience the syndrome. So I think one of the main takeaway points and something that we really, really want to emphasize from this for this lecture is that you're not alone in this situation. Um, some of the statistics that we've seen is are like approximately 70% of the people will experience imposter syndrome at one point in their life. And that's a good chunk of the general population. And I think one thing I really like about this diagram is the fact that like a lot of people have it and you just need to kind of like maybe people aren't talking about it and that's why you real you think that you are alone but actually a lot of people experience it as well and an analogy that i would like to bring up is you know if you've been to a club or if you've been to a high school prom dance you know like you are always like nervous of going onto the dance floor like you're always nervous like you don't know what dance moves to put on you know you feel like everyone's watching you but it's only when you step onto the dance floor and you show those awkward moves and you have the best time of your life on the dance floor that you realize that, you know, a lot of people are probably thinking the same exact thing, right? They're probably feeling awkward, but if you are like willing to make a fun of yourself, willing to share what you're feeling with others, it will like make, it will be a good night and, or it would be a good, like, you'll feel that you're not alone in this situation, which is, I think the most important part of kind of like lessening the symptoms of imposter syndrome. And we also do want to bring up, you know, some of the consequences if you don't end up like sharing with others or the things that kind of correlate to one another is like, you know, we already talked about depression, anxiety, but I think in for healthcare especially is like impaired job performance or dissatisfaction, right? You'll have, you'll burn out a lot faster because you're always constantly putting on an act. And if you don't, I feel like, I think all of us could agree, like when you're like trying to put on like put on a show or if you are not really showing your true self, it gets really tiring really fast. So I think that's something that we want to bring up as well. So um, what exactly does this mean for us, right? Um, uh, what can we do about everything? So there's a high, so based on everything that we've talked about so far, we would just like to reiterate that there's actually a high chance of imposter syndrome. 
amongst, especially like people who are attending this lecture, right? Aspiring healthcare professionals, pre-doctoral students and working professionals, imposter syndrome can happen to anyone. Um, it, there are external stressors for minority students, right? So lack of role models, if you're a first generation student, if there's cultural barriers to care, then there could be external stressors that would in, increase the amount of imposter syndrome that a person can a person can uh, have. <laughs> and also, lastly but not leastly, it's important to acknowledge imposter syndrome. So we need to validate our fears with our peers. Uh, we can un in this way we can understand its prevalence, like, and understand like who has imposter syndrome, and it may or may not be the people that you would expect. Um, and if honestly, if things are more difficult, there's also group therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy that um, an individual can seek out. So uh, to kind of end this presentation, I think it would be remiss to not mention that I also have imposter syndrome. I find it extremely ironic that I was given this topic and I also have imposter syndrome. <laughs> And while we, while Jen and I were kind of looking through these different studies, I had realized that I probably had imposter syndrome at a very early age, uh, like the type A that the one of the first initial studies had gone through. Um, I don't know if anyone else remembers this, but in around around fourth grade, I would like to say they start putting you into these like honors math programs, like the gate programs, <laughs> and almost every all of my friends were put into this program and my mom had turned to me and she's like hey how come you're not in this gate program but all of your friends are in this program and so I think from that point I had started consciously and subconsciously started comparing myself to others like am I doing everything that I can do compared to my peers am I doing all the extracurriculars that I'm supposed to be doing so I can get into a good college, right? And then while being in undergrad, I think it really, it really, it really starts amping up, right? Because it's like once you're in undergrad, you kind of are with people who are like-minded as you. And especially in like a, if you're in biology or some other pre-health major, you tend to start comparing yourself to others again, right? And understanding like do I have a good score like do I have a good GPA will I make it into this program and I think while in undergrad I actually learned more about imposter syndrome I also didn't really know the term imposter syndrome like going into college but understanding like what imposter syndrome is and how it can lead to burnout it's also really important to recognize that everyone is growing as a person um, it's it, as as much as it is important to look forward, it, all, it is also important to look back, right? It's important to acknowledge how far you've gone, how far you've come, how much you've grown. And I really want to emphasize that you are enough. And sometimes it doesn't feel like you're, <laughs> you're enough, but you are enough. And that you are all growing. We are all growing as people. Yeah, so like the other gen, I mean, I didn't have such an early childhood experience with imposter syndrome, which thank God. Um, but I definitely had it when I went into college. So, like you know, throughout your high school, you you see the same you see the same two hundred people two hundred people over and over. So, like I feel like I felt you know I feel satisfied with what I achieved in high school, like academically, extracurricularly. But then when I went to college, I like it was kind of like mind blowing. Like, it was like, you know, going to Berkeley, it was like, I remember very distinctly at my third floor dorm meeting, I sit down and I like turn to the, like, to the people like left and right of me. And then we were just like, hey, where are you from? You know, you know, the casual, you know, the lighthearted conversations you had. And then you go and then they go like, oh yeah, I was the valedictorian of so-and-so high school, or I'm the salutatorian of this so-and-so high school. I think everyone on my floor that like over neighbors next to me were some form of like top 10 in high school. And I was just like, huh, <laughs> like it, it constantly made me like feel like, do I belong here? Like, 
do I deserve to be here? Like that was like the actual question, like a quote that I wrote in the very beginning of the PowerPoint, like that was constantly going through my mind. And then like, I think that led me like throughout my first year of college that I started having second doubts. Like I wouldn't apply for certain club positions because I didn't believe that I was capable uh, enough to lead, some, lead a group or I, I just like felt very, like lack, lacking confidence is basically the way to put it, right? And then at that time, like the other Jennifer, I feel like I didn't know the term imposter syndrome. I think if I knew about it then, I would have told myself like, hey, like a lot of people are experiencing this. It's normal. Like it's normal to feel like that. And the only way to, for you to get out of this hole and kind of like is to just take the opportunity. Like there's tons of opportunities out there, both in college and dental school in whatever career you have. And it's the only way to kind of like fight against imposter syndrome is to take that chance and to give yourself a chance to, you know, perhaps like become a leader too. Right. So I think for those who are pre pre health today in the lecture, I think that's something that I really want to emphasize, or hopefully that's a takeaway point is, you're not, you're really not alone. You are enough, like Jennifer, the other Jennifer said, said, you have the capabilities, just go for it, right? Like, I think that's one of the most important points. And uh, I just wanted to mention, um, thanks for Melissa for moderating this whole, uh, this whole lecture. And thanks for Allegra, Kristen, uh, Kristen and McKenna and Dr. Bibb for helping us throughout this presentation. Um, and if you would like to share your own experiences or if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type in the chat and we can you can unmute yourselves or something. But yeah, thanks a lot.